Hello and welcome to this week's episode where I'm joined by Amy Suto, who is a full-time digital nomad, writer and author of a current book, Nomad Detective, which we'll talk about today. She is also an avid traveller. She began her career as a Hollywood TV writer and is now helping people become freelance writers like herself. So we're going to talk about all of that today and some maybe some favourite travel destinations for digital nomading, but also just for personal travel. So Amy, welcome to the show. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me, James. Please tell the listeners where you are, and it's a pleasure to have you on. Yeah, I am in the beautiful island of Madeira, which we talked about a little bit because you've been here before too. And it's just gorgeous. Like if, Even though it is the end of September, middle of September, it's still swimming weather. I was in the ocean all day yesterday, just like going for an afternoon swim. It's sunny and beautiful, and the produce is amazing, and the little farmer's market has all these exotic <laughs> fruits. Like It's beautiful. How was the flight in? Because it's notorious for difficulty landing, right? Yeah, it was totally fine. I watched all of these, like, I doom scrolled, like, the TikTok videos of people being like, this is the most dangerous airport <laughs> in the world, and you will definitely crash and die. And I'm like, excellent, perfect. <laughs> but our flight in here from London was actually very stress-free. Nothing bad happened, so that's good. Yeah, same. It was pretty uh, harmless in the end. Uh, but you have seen those videos, haven't you, where they, because the crosswind, right, it, 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 the, the plane is literally on the side, isn't it, going down. It's quite scary. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's it's nuts, but happily landed safely. But some people that are here, some of the fellow nomads, they some of their friends got their flights canceled because the winds were too strong, so they had to like leave and they couldn't they couldn't land. And so it was really interesting to hear hear about that. So happy to have avoided all of that. Yeah, I think the pilots have to do an extra training session about Madeira. I think they have to just deal with the crosswinds, so or at least okay. have that on their CV. So obviously it's a difficult place to land. So I'm glad you made it safely. My first question is. Where did you initially grow up and was travel part of your upbringing? Yeah, so I grew up in this like small town in Arizona where people ride horses to work. It's kind of like this little suburb with like Starbucks on one side and then like uh, horse like rodeos on the other and like wow. nothing. So it was this kind of strange place to grow up. Travel wasn't totally a big part of my upbringing. We did a lot of road trips to California because California is amazing and, and it's where everyone in Arizona wants to be, but is it? Oh, I, Arizona's the worst. So okay. I, if, if, any, if anyone likes Arizona, Good for you. I do not. Uh, but I, yeah, I didn't really do a lot of uh, travel, especially not very much international travel growing up. And my first solo international trip was when I was like 25, I think. And I decided wow. to go to Paris and Berlin on my own and, and just was like, let's go. Like, I'm going to get out of here. And I loved it so much. And then I just kind of kept, I got I caught the travel bug and I kept traveling and eventually turned travel into my full-time lifestyle as a digital nomad. Do you think any Americans that do you take the dip to Europe, for example, like you did? Did it ever come back disappointed? I mean, I, I do hear a lot that the Americans who do travel for leisure, not for business, just for leisure, and they go to Europe, they do come back and say, I loved it. I've never really heard them say much about they didn't like it. Yeah, I think especially for me, what was kind of crazy is that I, a few years ago, I was diagnosed with an autoimmune disease that I healed through travel, which was really fascinating wow. when I like spent two months in Italy and I came back and had to take a blood test. My doctor's like, what did you do in Italy? And I'm like, I just ate pizza ate for two months. <laughs> so yeah, two months straight. I didn't, I wasn't like, not like back in the in the States where I'm like eating vegan, like just salads. I'm like, no, I just ate pizza for two months. He's like, keep doing that. And I was like, okay, doctor's orders. I'm going to go just like live wow. in the world and eat pizza, which I can't do in the US. And then eating pizza in Italy and other places cured me and reversed my autoimmune disease. And I got off all my medication and I just completely reversed it. And I, I, I strongly believe it's the food quality abroad, not just in Europe, but not in the US. Whatever we're doing to our food in the US, bad. I was, I was saying that's my next point. Do you think it's just the quality of produce that you get to eat? And the reason I say that is because I was at a podcast movement event uh, about a month ago now, actually. And the first person I bumped into, because I don't know anyone there, right? So you're trying to speak to podcasters. And she's a gut health podcaster, doctor, written books, etc. And I said to her, oh, it's funny you should say that because I do have problems with my gut. But only really since I've moved to Canada. She goes, well, how long ago was that? I said, I don't know, five, six years ago. She goes, yeah, it's the food. I'm like, shut off the bat. So you're saying I should go back to Europe? She goes, well... <laughs> you've got, got to accept that North, North American food is not that great. So you need to make that decision, right? I was like, ah, oh, so you said that as well, which is quite amazing. And also, isn't it shocking? Yeah, well, I think that there's, a, I remember reading this medical study showing that immigrants who moved to the US, mm. their, their good gut bacteria decreased so quickly, like within, and like to like, in the next generation, it just got, it got worse and worse. And so 
I think it's like it's definitely the pesticides and like the produce quality. Even here, when you know we went to the the organic produce farmers market here today in Madeira, and we picked up like the cutest little grapes that have seeds in them, and they don't look like American grapes. And even like the little bananas here that taste like limes that are amazing, they can't be exported because they aren't aesthetically what other grocery yeah. stores like because they're too small, but they're beautiful and delicious. And so eating real food in other countries, especially when I was in Istanbul and eating their Turkish breakfast with all the fresh uh, produce that are a part of that, I was just like, America has got some problems. <laughs> like this is real food. Crazy ate pizza and it cured it. I mean, that is mental. I can't get my head around that. Yeah, so obviously... You're going to Europe, big change. Big, was there culture shock? Was there any thoughts? Oh, maybe, do you know what? I need to go back. I think the thing that really kind of started my digital nomad journey was actually during the pandemic. So I okay. had started traveling with a bunch of my friends and we had initially started with just a road trip around the US where we rented out all the Airbnbs that nobody was using since it was in the middle of COVID. Everyone was mm. still like disinfecting their, their Amazon packages with Lysol. <laughs> and so it was like everyone was trapped inside and we're like, we are going to go to Colorado. We're going to get every all of our friends out of you know, Los Angeles, and we're going to, like, rent this big house in Colorado and spend, like, a month in the, the wood to get away from all of the insanity. And so we love that so much. My partner Kyle and I and then the rest of our friends, we continued to travel around the U.S. and mm. stayed in just beautiful places. And then when Europe opened up, we were like, let's go to Europe. And then that's when, you know, the pizza, like, cured me, basically. And, like, things got, like, were really, it was really cool. And so after that kind of first stint, I was like, okay, I want to be a digital nomad full time for the next few years, and then we can decide where we want to live. Because at that point, I was exiting Hollywood, and I wasn't quite wanting to return to my work as a TV writer. And and so that kind of when the digital nomad lifestyle took out, and that's also when I finally started transitioning into my first like few six figure years as a freelance writer, and when I started to really kind of see, kind of see my business blow up. And then I also started doing my own creative writing work outside of the industry and that kind of like when everything transitions i think that there's something magical about travel that inspires you and also simultaneously being a minimalist while you travel means there's fewer distractions in some ways yeah. where you're not having to deal with the upkeep of a car an apartment and like things like that and you have less responsibilities so you can be more in the moment which i think helps creatively and also helps business-wise when you're just focusing on the work that you're doing and enjoying the moment while you're traveling and working. Yeah, and up to that point, you mentioned there about your career. So up to COVID, um, even that trip as well. So you're just like doing the classic career, writing in Hollywood. Um, what is that like in terms of a, a career? I can imagine it's intense, but I only hear that from maybe like, you know, corporate people who say that their, their lifestyle was intense. It's all about work. Is that the same for writing or is it a bit more ad hoc where it depends what projects come up? Yeah, so I worked my way up from assistant at an agency, at a talent agency, to eventually being able to write episodes of TV and working with CIA agents on my episode of Spy Thriller, which was very fun. Oh. But I think I think what was really kind of jarring for me is when I got into the industry and I finally started to get the drafts that I wanted, was I was looking around at the people around me and I'm like, I don't feel like that everyone's very be here and we're all mm. playing pretend and talking about conspiracy theories of the cia and we're not having a blast <laughs> <laughs> and i'm like i'm having i'm having more fun working with my freelance writing clients who are flying me out to ghostwrite their memoirs and like i'm doing these kind of crazy jobs that people are paying me like so much money for and then i enter the hollywood tv world and then all of a sudden my skills are being undervalued people are asking me to work for free mm. and i'm just like i I don't, I don't know about this. Like, I think I'm going to go do this thing over here. And so it was kind of in part, my freelance writing work was sweeping me up into this world of like travel and meeting really fascinating people. I started ghostwriting memoirs for Olympians and NBA players and really inspiring people around the world. And I was like, I think this is more fun. And it was a, kind of a shock because I, I, I had grown up wanting to be a TV writer, wanting to be a novelist, which is what I'm doing now. More, But I think with Hollywood, just the industry is in such a dire place and Los Angeles is becoming the next Detroit and it's like really falling apart. Mm -hmm. And and that's just because of the way that the industry is built and the way that it's not coming to like reckon with like everything that has happened with the streaming, the bubble that has burst and there's like so much going on there and it's like people are very unhappy about it and like some bad actors have really ruined a lot of things for people. And I think that when the pandemic hit, that was a wake up call for me to refocus on the thing that I was already doing on the side, which was freelancing. And I just put more energy into it. And I just saw it take off. Yeah, I think I was going to say, at least you had the freelancing on the side. I guess it's more 
intense or even more worrying if you don't have anything on the side to fall onto because obviously if you're trying to think ah oh, i need to get out of this but there's no way possible or you're starting from scratch you're trying to get clients that's a bit more of a challenge but the fact you had it on the side you maybe obviously knew subconsciously maybe one day if it does get too much and obviously pandemic come along and change everything but like you could think oh do you know what i could do that freelance and you've obviously figured a way out where you don't have to be location dependent so that must be a pretty big achievement but also relief that you can actually leave that role in Hollywood and then go out and do your own thing yeah I think the future is freelance for a lot of people and I think that that's a good thing like I think that freelancing has sometimes gotten like a bad rap and mm. lumped in with the gig economy as like oh it's just only low paying and it sucks but in reality if you build your freelancing career right and I actually wrote a whole book on this called six figure freelancer mm. that is kind of breaking down all of the things I wish somebody had like shaken me and told me about how to set rates on an appropriate letter level, about how to figure out how to negotiate with clients, how to value your skills, mm -hmm. how to raise rates year after year, like things like that, that I, that I feel like really kind of created a foundation for my freelancing career that didn't cause burnout because I was burning out again and again and again until I learned these lessons. And I feel like, but once I learned them and everything unlocked, I'm just like, wow, okay, life is really good now. <laughs> like, I want to share this with other people. And so I made a lot of free content for people. And, and I just, like, I'm so passionate about it because I see how freelancing allows the kind of security that you don't have in a traditional job when mm. you have, like, four or five clients instead of one job. Then if one client drops or two clients drop, you can always go replace those clients versus if you have one full-time job with one skill set in one specific industry, if that job or that role goes away, then you have to suddenly all of your income stops and you have to go find another job and then everything kind of feels out of balance. I do think freelancing is the future and freelancing and content creation and like combination of different things. I think everybody should be kind of thinking about that. If you have that entrepreneurship kind of like pull and, and like sparking you, then there's so much cool things to be done. Yeah, I'm definitely like you. I'm a bit of a creative, hence the podcast and I've got a degree in music, right? So I'm trying to figure out uh, not to be the classic, um, I guess like nine to five, uh, how do you put it, office job where maybe you're good at it, but it's not like that fulfilling, right? So it's a bit of a challenge uh, going forward. So do you think COVID changed things for you or were you already thinking about it on the way out of changing your lifestyle? Or do you think that actually was the trigger that got you going? Yeah, I think I talk about this a lot with my partner, Kyle, and, and with friends and other nomads we meet. I think that the pandemic, as horrible as it was, really did change our lives in a good direction because I think it, and I've talked to some other people who felt similarly where we were forced to like hit pause and, you know, like reevaluate our lives and go into therapy and like think in like the darkness of the pandemic, like what mattered to us and, and yeah. face our own mortality and also understand like, what do I want for the rest of my life? And so I think that it kind of created this moment of pause where we were all stuck inside and I think that that was kind of a, a really cool opportunity to reset and, and also kind of created, you know, it made me reconcile what my life was and where I wanted it to go. Because before that, before COVID, I was definitely kind of like burning myself out. I was going through like party girl era in Los Angeles that was not healthy. <laughs> and since then, I've like quit alcohol, quit caffeine and like oh, wow. completely gotten healthy and changed everything and for the better. And I feel like yeah. none of that would have happened had I stayed in the same kind of environments, the same circles, the same habits. And so I think everyone was impacted differently by the pandemic. But I think that having that moment to pause for me and the journey that I went to was such a, a gift in, in some ways. Yeah, it's the environment, right? You're changing that. That's the big one. I know habits come into it and I guess people and relationships, but the environment, um, I guess if you keep thinking you're going to change in the same environment, that's quite difficult, isn't it? Imagine you're, I don't know, maybe you don't like your job, but you're thinking, oh, do you know what? I'll I'll change my habits to like your job. It's not really going to work because you don't like it. You've got to be honest, right? And I think that's why the great, um, would call it the uh, the reset or people start quitting their jobs, right, in uh, in COVID because they thought, you know what? It's not for me. And it, it's amazing it took sort of pandemic-like conditions to get that across the people, right? I, I do wonder before then, were people already thinking it on a lower level but just thought there's no way possible? Like, what's going to change my life to get me going, right? But obviously a pandemic would do that. And obviously it's quite yeah. unprecedented. James, what do you feel like? Do you feel like your life changed before and after the pandemic? Do you feel like what it was start? It's an interesting one for us because we just moved to Canada the year before, right? And that was on a work permit. So two years you get in Canada. And the idea was we're going to live in Canada. We're going to see US, see the West Coast. And we're going to live that lifestyle for two years. And obviously halfway through COVID happened. But then what choice do you have? 
they started extending permits. We started, oh, do you know what? Let's try and get residency. So then that changed. That's a new thing I never thought before. Oh, let's get permanent residency. And that's now leading to a passport. So that's different and an option. But also it did make me reflect on my previous travels. So I'm like, oh, do you know what? Traveling's great, but I need to make it long term, not just a short term. And what I mean by that is, yeah, I've done the classic quick job, go for six months or a year quite a few times. And I actually done it afterwards, interestingly, because um, of burnout, I think. But from that trip last year was, oh, do you know what? This needs to change. But I think COVID played a part. A lot of questions are asked. Yeah. Yeah. But I, yeah, I did struggle. Yeah, it was a struggle. I don't know what, how you felt in terms of being indoors all the time. And do you know what? I actually thought I was an indoors person, but actually it turned out I wasn't during COVID. So that was a, that was a new lesson for me as well. But I did struggle with that. And when your life is travel pretty much like it was at that point for me and you can't do it, that's a big problem. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think I think it definitely also kind of at least for for me and and the people around me, I feel like getting out in nature became more important during COVID, and and I think that that's why what also sparked our initial road trip of like we got to get to the woods. We spent a month here. We spent a month here, and that's why it's always been nice in the travel that I've been doing the last few years. Is we were in London before this, and then now we're here in Madeira to balance that city with with the city life with the nature. And so I think that that kind of I feel like humans need both things. It's just like you can't just be in, in pavement jungles; like you have to have like the nature to kind of make yourself not go insane. Okay, so for you after, well, not after, yeah, during during after COVID, when it started to settle down a little bit and travel was possible after the few lockdowns, what was your journey next? And so were you thinking, I need to get more work just to get into this freelance world or were you thinking straight away do you know what i need to go somewhere different and be based there like what were you thinking at that point yeah it was kind of everything at once i was running a scripted podcast company so i was producing three scripted podcasts while traveling the world while growing my my freelancing career and continuing to plan more travel indefinitely and so it just kind of became this thing where it was like more of everything and and that was like a little chaotic in the beginning but it ended up working out really well and the freelancing career just completely took off and ended up being like all encompassing. I, I did so much, so many different books for book projects for different people because my main focus is memoir ghostwriting and book ghostwriting and editing. And mm-hmm. so that just kind of completely took over. And there just happened to be weeks like that, just like all of a sudden, like three books land. I'm like, all right, next year, like this whole rest of this year, I'm totally booked. Okay. So like <laughs> this is what I'm focusing on. And so it's been really cool to have just like these projects fall out of the sky. And like even this week, having like a bunch of new clients just jump out of nowhere. And so I think oh, that wow. that's the fun of freelancing is just to like, just be like kind of like going about your normal day with your normal workload. And then all of a sudden a bunch of clients land in and change everything. And that's like what I love because I love the work that I do. And I think that there's such a, like an opportunity now for self-publishing in a way that there wasn't in the past mm-hmm. where self-publishing is becoming more of a viable career and business for people, especially through Amazon KDP where they handle all the shipping for you and all of the returns and customers and taxes, like all of the calculations that you would have to do on your own shop and, you know, the printing of the books and all of that, they handle all of that for you. And the books look indistinguishable from a traditionally published book. And I think that that is something that is like completely like unforeseen, like uh, a few decades ago. And so we're kind of at this point where anybody who wants to write a book and publish a beautiful book that reaches audiences that turns into a business and passive income forever you can do it. And I think that that is something that is like the new gold gold rush. And a lot oh. of people, it's like kind of going under their radar a little bit because, you know, people, you know, authors nobody has ever heard of are buying entire like poems with money from their Amazon KDP earnings, their book royalties that you've never heard of them. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's kind of inspiring because there's so many niches of specific readers that are look, looking for different kinds of things. And I think that there's so much opportunity in the book world. And I've been kind of chasing that for a while. And I've always been a, a book fan. And I grew up working in my parents' book bookstore where they like sold shipped books online. And like, I, uh, I just love the world of books. And it's just really cool to see it growing in the way that it has recently. Yeah, that's amazing because we're going to come to your book in a second. Um, I'm actually writing my own book at the minute. So I'm going to go the self-publishing route because I've done like 150 oh, guests on the podcast, right? So uh, I think that alongside my own travel stories the last decade, I think is a good combination of reaction to the podcast episodes, some some quotes, but also my own stories, right? I think it's quite a nice little mix. So I'm in the process of that, but it's daunting because I don't actually think the writing part is hard. It's all the stuff after it, right? So um, I will go self-publishing route as well, but I know nothing about it. So that's like probably next year's uh, thought process. But it is exciting to write a book though, isn't it? It's, 
it's one of those things I think alongside being a musician, I think having an album that's kind of, well, back in the old days, to be a CD in a, in a shop, not so much these days, but as a equivalent for an author, I think it's pretty cool to have your book just there in a bookshop where someone could just browse past it, look at it and buy it. That's a pretty cool feeling, surely. Yeah, I, it's really cool because the before and after of writing the book, any book that you write is just such a stark difference. Even in, in my own books, after I published my first book, Six Figure Freelance Writer, I just had an outpouring of people who were reaching out to me and saying how much my book changed their life and, and uh-huh. allowed them to start their freelancing business. And, and I'm still getting people, I think it's like been a year and a half since I published it, who are just reaching out and, and telling me about how much like their, the book has helped them. And that's really cool. And yeah, people that's awesome, can then yeah. come into my, my orbit. I've read it to some people on my travels who read my book. And then we have like, there's already, they already know so much about me and like the things that I've like, that I kind of like would want to share with them so that we can then accelerate the conversation where I need to know them. And like, I feel like having a book is kind of like catching people up on your life and where you, what you've learned and what you've done. And you can kind of have deeper conversations because of that. Mm. Um, And so it's not just like a calling card or a way to grab clients or increase your, your business revenue. It does all of those things, but it's also such a connector to people that you maybe wouldn't have met otherwise. And even my fiction book, which just came out two months ago or a month and a half ago now, has been just like attracting a lot of really amazing people into my orbit and people are coming out of nowhere who've never met being like i love the book when is the second one coming yeah, yeah. that's awesome like, you can't beat that that's amazing and yeah, like, yeah. you can't beat that yeah. and i think that as, as a writer like i think that more people should hit publish faster because i think that there's it attracts you to the reader the readers that you're meant to write for will be attracted to you sooner and that's why I think self-publishing is more powerful than traditional publishing because there's just that huge delay with traditional publishing of it takes two to three years to go through that process. Mm. You could sell a book and then it could never get published. It could get killed in the process. So there's so many different things that just like will keep you from getting to your ideal readers faster. And then you still have to do marketing if you go traditional publishing because publishers don't market books very well anymore. And they expect True. you to hire your own publicist out of your advance. And so... I've seen so many horror stories of people who've gone the traditional publishing route that I just feel like so much more empowered as a self-published writer to like see, be able to have full control over my books and then also be able to have like the great little dashboard of book sales being like, you sold 108 books this month. You're like, <laughs> amazing. Like that's so cool to be able to have that hit of like people are reading your book and supporting you as a writer. And I think that that dopamine hit helps the writing process for the next book. And so once you start publishing, it becomes addictive. So I'm really excited for you. Oh, wow. Yeah, I think the idea that if you go self-publishing route and you obviously do the costs up front because obviously you're going self-publishing route, it's nice to know that at least every book that comes in afterwards is yours in terms of the whether the money is or the sale number, right? You're not kind of tied to an advance or at least trying to hit some figures that they want you to hit. I guess that leaves the pressure a little bit because if you're published through traditional ways, I guess they would have targets. They want you to go on. I guess they take a cut of your obviously of your of your sales because they need to recoup the the advance. It sounds a really difficult process from a traditional point of view. So the self publishing point of view, if it's getting easier, that's a result. That means more books are going to come out. Uh, it's exciting times if you've got an idea of a book. Maybe like you can just get writing it and just like you say hit publish. I think you're right about that. I, I was thinking about same podcasting, publishing, even music. You can always refine it. You can always change it. it. does have to come to a point where you need to let perfection go out the window and just get it out there, right? And I think there's a beauty in that because it won't be totally perfect. And it'd be like little nuances that maybe people like. Do you think, oh, do you know what? That wasn't meant to be in there. But hey, people love it. Yeah, I think a great example of this is I've been reading like more in like the romanticy genre because that's like the big genre that's huge right now. And I read this book called Quicksilver earlier this week. It I fell in love with it despite it being riddled with typos, riddled with <laughs> errors. And it it got like all over like 200,000 reviews on Amazon and people are loving it and obsessed over it. It's like this whole moment yeah. and like the author's just blowing up because the story is that good. Yeah, so I yeah, think that yeah. reading that book, I was just like, and I know it's going to get like revised and there's going to be a new edition to it. It's going to get, you know, updated at some point. But I think that that's kind of like the exciting thing is like she published that book a few months ago and it just completely destroyed the internet in that corner of that that genre. And I think that like if you find your audience, no matter what genre you're in, people will obsess over it and your imperfections won't deter them from reading and and sharing your book. And so it's just about it's all about the story. And I think that that's something that I I think is really key. Obviously, you don't want any typos, but you can always the nice thing about self-publishing. You can always just upload a new file where you get rid of the typo. Yeah, yeah. I think the problem I have is I'm not very good at English. 
So I would have typos, grammar errors. So I use something like Grammarly. But the problem with that is you can also choose your options, right, about what's supposed to be casual or informative. You can choose what it's supposed to be, but then it does end up correcting a lot of stuff that you might just say normally in real life. So that it kind of takes away the nuance of you. So it's a real hard one because I'm like, oh, maybe it's right grammatically, but is it right from what I'm trying to say in the way I'm trying to say it? It's a quite difficult one uh, to get around. But I think I have to go Grammarly because I don't trust myself to not have typos or bad English. Definitely, but yeah. There you go. Yeah. I've got one more question before we dive into books, because I will forget it. When you come into the freelance world, so you left your traditional career and stuff and you're going freelance, did it take a while to work out how much time you actually have for projects? So what I mean by this is you could get like three or four book offers in this week or whatever, but how did you know how long like a book offer would take or ghostwriting a book or any other services? Like How long did it take for you to figure that out? Because obviously if you say yes to everything, you're not going to have time for everything. So how did you figure that out? Yeah, I think it's for the nice thing for the first few years of my career is I was almost exclusively doing a lot of hourly assignments. So even okay. a lot of full book projects, I just did hourly because I'm like, I have no idea how long this is going to take, especially some of the very like research intensive books. Mm. Now I know exactly how long a book is going to take so I can quote a fixed rate. But when I was kind of getting started with some of the earlier books, like hey, I know I'm going to underbill if I if I try to like put, throw out a number. And so I think that I have a lot of calculators on my website and in my book, my book, The Trigger Freelance Writer, about how to break down, okay, how many hours is your ideal work week? And then what is your hourly rate? And then what are the expenses that you're going to have to pay in your business? Now, here's the math equation to make it all work. And here's what you quote your clients. And so I think you do have to start with some pen and paper math of like understanding what your hourly rate needs to be. And even if you're setting a fixed rate, it's like you have to then figure out like how long do you think that project is going to take? And then mm. you add like a 30% cushion on top of what you're going to quote your client so that if it takes longer, you're not working overtime. And there's not always going to be those random projects that end up being more time intensive than others. And some also can take less time. But I think that when it comes to finding that holistic work-life balance and not burning out and having time for your creative projects, it is a little bit trial and error. And it's also about... You know, in the beginning of your freelancing career, you're just having to put in a mountain of effort to get anywhere. And then once you have like the flywheel going of clients finding you and returning clients and, and all the stuff coming into you, then you don't have to go out and find clients. You don't have to sure. pitch. You don't have to do any of that. So suddenly all of that time is freed up. And so I think that I always tell the the freelancers that I that I coach and I help with their, their freelancing career in the beginning, it's like, it's going to suck in the beginning. Like you're going to have to do like a mountain of work in the beginning, but you're setting yourself up for success in the long run where then as, as you continue to grow like the SEO of your website and, and find different passive ways to generate leads for, for clients finding you, then once that work is done, then a 20 hour work week, 30 hour work week, like that can kind of be more of what your, your, your target can be so that the extra hours can be just for, for free creative work. Yeah, I guess when it gets towards like the middle part where you've done a, a few years, I guess you then start thinking, well, I do want to travel a little bit or I do want to be a like, digital nomad. I want to go and like, live somewhere for a bit, but not totally work four hours. So I guess then you start thinking, well, how many hours do I want to chop off? And I guess that relates to how many projects you can take on, but also what you charge, right? Because if you charge more, I guess you work less. I guess that's a classic math equation. So yeah, it's quite, an, it's quite an exciting journey if you're up for it, isn't it? I think you if you get like, projects coming in and and you're you're busy with offers and you can even say no to stuff that's a pretty good place to be yeah no and it's been really amazing and i've even when i was in hollywood and i was like just starting to build my freelancing career i was always like evangelizing about it to other people i'm just like guys like we don't have to work for minimum wage there's actually people <laughs> on the internet that like value our skill set <laughs> I guess it's crazy. And so I think that like freelancing is kind of the a great equalizer. If you mm. have interesting skills, whether it's writing or creating or whatever, there's people that want to hire you and work with you. And I think that the, the polymaths that have like a bunch of interesting skills and the creative people are going to have the biggest edge in this like AI saturated world where in order to stand out be above the machine, mm. then you have to have that creative flair to you. So I think that the people who are best positioned in this kind of new economy that's emerging are the flexible freelancers and creatives and people kind of like building things and finding value that they can address. And it kind of requires a little bit of that entrepreneurship mindset, which is why I kind of try to bring a lot of what I learned on the business side into my my first book, because I was like, 
they don't teach me, they didn't teach me this and this was holding me back. I had all of the skills, but I didn't have how to negotiate with a client or set a boundary or raise my rates or how to calculate the math of how to make this lifestyle work in a holistic way. And so I think the business side is often what us creatives are kind of like lacking. But once you put both of those halves together, it's just like the floodgates open and suddenly life is great. And so that's kind of like what I try to help people cross is that that path where both of those things come together because it's just completely changed my own life. Okay. And that brings us nicely on to the books. I actually want to touch on your first book that you mentioned there. Can you tell the listeners and the viewers what the book is titled and also what is the premise of the book? Yeah. So my first book is Six Figure Freelancer, Finding a Holistic Guide to Finding Freedom in Freelancing. And that is my nonfiction book that is basically a how to build your six figure freelancing career and also a bunch of stories that I like my own travels and how like they relate to how I was trying to build different clients and my failures and the lessons that I learned and like the business sense that I learned. So it's partially kind of like a little bit of like a personal essay memoir because I think that the stories that I included really illustrate some of the hangups and the stumbling blocks that a lot of us creatives have of not having the confidence or not being able to pitch ourselves and and the things that I dealt with building my my freelancing career. So that's the first book that I put out. And then the second one is called The Nomad Detective Volume 1. And that is a fiction debut about a uh, traveling nomad detective private eye inspired by my travels as a digital nomad. Yeah, talk to Talk to us more about the fictional book because I do you want to hear like a sort of shocking but random fact. I don't really read fiction that much. Oh, I, only wow. read, I only read nonfiction. Yeah. And you're a creative person. You're a musician. You're an artist. I know. And do you know what it relates to? This is interesting. When I was at music college, I was there for four years and you, you get your classes, right? You get your, your sight reading, you read the music, the performances. The one I just didn't like the most and it kind of makes sense is improvisation. I'm like, I don't want to improvise. I just want to know what I'm playing, which kind of relates to Fiction, non-fiction alike, I guess what I like is real stories, I guess. And I know it's based on a true story, even though that's quite a loose phrase. But fiction, I, I've read a few fiction books, but I, I'm trying to get better at it because I don't do well with fictions. I'd like to give yours a go. But can, yeah, can you tell the listeners, because it's traveled, it's traveled themes, that's good for me. What is the backstory and what can you expect from the book? Yeah, so basically I came up with this idea in a bar in Buenos Aires at like 2 a.m. Like that was kind of like the seed. Start of the night. So... The start of the night out, that was 2 a.m. <laughs> yeah, the very very start of the night, if anyone's been to Argentina, like, you know. And so I was basically sitting around with a bunch of friends who are also digital nomads, and we were all talking about our time in Argentina. And somebody's like, have you heard about this like crazy like new drug that people are using to like knock out travelers and steal all their stuff and like, and so we started talking about all these crazy crime stories, like below the level of like what we normally talk about. Mm. Like usually digital nomads talk about like our favorite places that we've gone. Sure. Like, yeah. the, like, and then you see like the Instagrams of all of these, like, you know, Machu Picchu and like Costa yeah. Rica. And then we don't talk about like the people getting robbed and like, like all the people are going missing and like all of this crazy stuff that I am fascinated by because I always love to think about the worst case scenario. And and I was just like, this is really interesting. And, and so I wanted to kind of take this idea of like, what if there was somebody who helps these people or expats mm. or travelers who have gone missing or things have gone terribly wrong? Like who helps these people? Because obviously the local police are not going to do anything about most of these things. And so yeah. there's always kind of been these like in like these, these missing persons cases, there should be like this third party brought in. And so that kind of kind of brought to me this idea of this new version of Sherlock Holmes of this like private eye nomad detective who's traveling the world first. Her main goal is to find her missing sister who's gone missing in Guatemala. But as she's doing so, she's trying to collect clues by helping other people and solving their cases. And so she's kind of embarking on this journey. And she's also aided by this like ability that she has to see auras and to kind of sense people and who's lying to her. And so she has a little bit of like some extra skills, just like how Sherlock has his, uh, his sense of deduction. He has this ability to kind of sense what people's auras are. And she has synesthesia. So our senses get a little mixed up. And so it's really interesting to kind of like play with this lens of a character who has like an, an ability to kind of like parse through what people are saying to her and what's true and, and to kind of like figure out who she's dealing with as he's traveling the world and running into these people that are either running towards something or running away from something and are not what they seem. And everything is kind of loosely inspired by my own travels throughout the world and all of the things that have happened kind of on like one layer below in the underground of travel of like where things have gone wrong. Yeah, you do hear those stories, though, don't you, when you travel, when you're, like, hanging out at a hostel and you just hear so many stories. Like, I, I do remember one in India where 
there's like 10 of us are sitting there recording stories and some people just can like maybe maybe people who just started traveling can believe some of the stories that you hear i do wonder like with, with your book have you kind of disguised it but is there some stories that you maybe experienced or just heard through other travelers uh, it, it kind of blends it's, it's kind of a blend of different things like when we were doing the inca trail the 26 yeah. mile hike to machu picchu in peru um i heard just some incredible stories that were kind of myths and legends about like ghost stories on the trail mm. and how there were and i just loved those i was like oh this is really interesting and so i tried to kind of pull as much as i could from local lore or like things that were happening that that kind of like that were like through the grapevine rumors and things like that and a lot more were a lot of the book is obviously fictionalized but i tried to kind of figure out how to pull from real stories to like give it that that feeling like grounded in truth of like you know when you're in peru you have a tour guide who's like pointing at these giant boulders in the middle of cusco and being like we have no idea how these stones got there they're too heavy for humans to to carry so it's probably aliens that was one of the stories has assumed <laughs> And I, I'm like, I love that. I love this idea of like these real life mysteries kind of creating a backdrop for a mystery that it, that my main character deals with in the, on the Inca Trail. And I was like, this would be a perfect place for a murder. And so I think that this is kind of like the, the fascinating kind of element of it is taking my real life experiences in these places and then fictionalizing events based on local legends, on true crime stories and, and kind of putting everything in a soup and, and making a play from it. Yeah, I, I was then thinking that's a good idea for even for a podcast, right? If you get like just travellers come on about stories I've ever experienced or heard, that'd be quite an interesting mm. podcast because I think so many people, if you travel for a while or like for a longer period of time, I think you can hear some stuff and even see some stuff as well. Like that, it, I just remember like the first thing I said about you know, Inca Trail, I was like, oh, what, what comes to mind for me? Of course, I've done the four day hike. It's great. It's hard work, bloody hard work. You get there, it's amazing, perfect morning. But the one thing that sticks out is a bit of a shame, really, apart from seeing it, Machu Picchu there, in clear blue sky, no one there, that when the tourists start to come from Aguas Calientes, they come up in their buses. We'd just done our morning there, so we kind of like were on the way back to Aguas Calientes to go and chill out because we'd been walking for four days. I just remember like some people just laughing at us. Like as we're coming down, because we're like, we're all sweating, we're all tired, we've all got our gear, we're all kind of like walking in line as if you were, as if you're hiking up. They're like, oh, it looks like they've been led away to prison. I think that's what someone said, like this American tourist. I'm like, that's the only thing I remember, apart from obviously the best bit of Machu Picchu. I don't really recall much of the trek, apart from day two, past Dead Woman's Pass. But other than that, I just remember looking at him going, oh, mate, we just walked for four days. Legs are tired. <laughs> we can barely walk now. Like, at least give us a bit of credit. But yeah, that's just what I remember. Not really like a okay. juicy story, but like just some things that stick in your mind, isn't it? I think it's such a badge of honor, though, because I've read a lot of and I've heard a lot of stories from people. If you just went to Machu Picchu with the the buses, a yeah. lot of people are like, oh, yeah, Machu Picchu, it's fine. But then if you hiked and you mm. see the Fort Inca Trail and you sweat and like you pass the alpa wild alpacas that look yeah. like they might like run you over and you're like, what's going on here? And then you <laughs> finally cross through the sun gate. And as the sun is rising, you see Machu Picchu. Yeah. The relief of not only thank God I'm done with hiking, but also there. This is what I've been hiking for, and I've been yeah. following this ancient path. Like I think that that's really special, and 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 that's why I put one of the the stories in the book. Why that is like one of the major set pieces of crossing through the sun gate, and then things are happening because I think that that's just such an epic, dramatic moment, and that that when you do that from that you can't experience when you're just busted and you're like Machu Picchu, like you just yeah. don't get the relief. It, you're not you don't earn it in the way that I think that. If you do the four day Inca Trail or the Salkante track, then you really earn like that view and that, that entry point into Machu Picchu. Yes, earning it, isn't it? Yeah. You really think. You... I, I got a selfie with a llama as well. Well, alpaca. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. A, it just came up to me. You, you do think they're going to walk over you. And I just gave it an Oreo because I had a little pack of Oreos. <laughs> and I just snapped at the right time where his left or his or hers left eye looked at the camera. So I got this selfie with this alpaca at Machu Picchu. Like, that is. That can't be beaten for me. I'm like, how how are you gonna get that in the future? Like there's nothing even people who do match your picture don't get that. So like, I do have that as a profile picture occasionally. It's quite a funny one. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. There you go. Okay. I've got some questions before I want to delve into some travels. Uh probably about books as well. Um, are you more comfortable writing nonfiction or fiction? Both. I think fiction was something I had to kind of dust off a little bit. I grew up writing novels for National Novel Writing Month, the, the 30 mm -hmm. day challenge where you write a novel in a month just for fun. So I did that for six years straight, high school into college. And I just love the process of novel writing because I think yeah. it, it definitely kind of like takes something out of your brain, and like allows you to, to like process something. 
And so I think that like novel writing is really special. And then nonfiction writing I like because I feel like it's very like it's a way to help people. Yeah. And I really love that ability to just like help others through sharing knowledge. And it's something that I'm passionate about that I do on my blog and on my sub stack. And so I have a lot of methods to try to help people learn the things that I wish somebody told me. And and then I feel like nonfiction is that that attempt to like exercise that feeling of like, oh, I wish someone told me that. So if I, if I wasn't told this, then other people would benefit from it. And how does your blogging help you as well in terms of writing a book? Or is it completely yeah. different? Yeah. So I started my blog uh, when I was like 12 and, it, and it's been like one of the main drivers of being able to like basically have clients find me and different opportunities find me. And then most recently I started my Substack paid newsletter, um, which is basically the the way that I share more knowledge and I have like a like paywall for certain posts. If you're hearing gigantic explosions in the background, it's because here in Madeira, they're doing a big like festival thing and, and they have like, oh, yeah, they give the, the drum. kids like the, <laughs> the, 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 like it, it's like so kind of explosion. And they give like the kids like the ability like to ring the bell near us. And you're just like, what is going on? And it's just, <laughs> it's like, it's very crazy and very celebratory here. And so that's what's it going on. It sounds like on. a drum. It's not World War. Yeah, it's, it's quite, not like uh, a drum. Yeah, it's, it's like, like a, a giant cannon or one. something. It's very, it's a very, 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 very noisy island sometimes, but it's very, they're very celebratory. But for, in terms of the Substack, like I think Substack is really interesting. Have you heard of the platform or are you familiar with it? Yeah, I'm, I'm technically on it. I just uh, gave up my yeah. there because no one really signed up. I've got like 22 or 23 subscribers, right? Uh, Substack is, I started using it because I found like MailChimp, not that good, a bit clunky, just didn't like it. So I know a few podcasters who use Substack, so I thought I'll, I'll start it. There's probably a project for me in the new year when I've got a few things out of the way this year, uh, including travels. I think I will get that going again. I, it's, it's just a bit of an art to write a good newsletter, I think. Yeah, but I think that once you kind of like capture, I think that, that the newsletter is like really interesting format for your audience because I think everybody checks their email in and in, in, because that's yeah. where a lot of important things come in. Whereas I have been on platforms with social media where... I like grown a platform and then all of a sudden the views start changing because the algorithm has changed and suddenly the 47,000 followers I've cultivated on TikTok are not seeing my posts. Mm. And so having an email newsletter for creators of any kind, I think is really helpful because the nice thing about Substack is you can download all your subscribers and like leave if you don't like the platform. Whereas like on TikTok, there's no way for me to reach all of my subscribers. And so I think that there is kind of like owning your own audience as like a writer or creator is really important because if you put too much effort into a platform that then either bans you or deletes your account or just deprioritizes your content, then you kind of lose that ability to communicate with your community. It's a great point because the other day, Instagram banned me for a day and I had no idea why. I just got the message yeah. saying, can't access your account. Uh, you're not following the guidelines. You have 90 days to appeal. If you don't appeal, it's going. I'm like, what? What's happened here? So I appealed it and I got, you know, got reinstated, but no idea why. And, and the shock, I actually thought if that happens, I don't care. But actually when it happened, I'm like, I, get like, I actually can't communicate my podcast episodes anymore. So that kind of got me thinking I need an alternative. I do have my website, which is fine. But unless you go there I'd, and maybe look at the show notes of the podcast or the YouTube I have, maybe you might go there. But you're right. I think the newsletter is a is a backup, but also a great way to communicate with your audience. And I think I will get that started again. And I feel, I feel like Substack has so many things available to you. I feel that's a bit of a thing to learn. There's newsletters, I get it, but you can do posts, you can do, I think, polls, I think, obviously, paid stuff as well. There's there's a lot of options on Substack. It looks like quite a good platform to use. Yeah, and I think it's what's, what's nice is, like, it's free podcast hosting, free email hosting, like, everything is free. And then, then Substack also brings you an audience, which I think is really great. And their discovery tools are amazing. So mm. that's why I think it's something that every creator should be prioritizing, because it's just, like, it's got so many things built in for so many creators. And I've seen just like a huge increase in my, in my subscribers from joining Substack. And I think that, I think it, it should be like the core. And I also think that a lot of people don't recognize how many people in their audience want to pay and support them. And getting mm, yeah. like that notification of like a new pay subscriber is just like, makes me so giddy, even though it's like a, <laughs> a very small piece of like my, my income. Like it's such a cool thing to be like, oh my gosh, this person is finding value from yeah. the things I'm sharing. Like that's so cool. And it, it's just like also brought a lot of awareness to the different services that I offer and the different things that I do and my book sales have like definitely grown because of it. And so I think a lot of people don't recognize like how once you have an email newsletter base, like it just like will help you with everything. And the nice thing about platforms like Substack and also Beehive is that they post the, your newsletters to a website for you that's part of your pl platform so that you can also get the Google traffic. 
mm-hmm. you're getting traffic from Substack, traffic from Google, and your newsletter can be revisited and reread rather than like a like a convert kit or a, or maybe not convert kit, but like a other some other platforms that just send the newsletter and then they're once they're in the ether, they're gone. Yeah. And I think that yeah. this is kind of like a great way for creators that have evergreen content like podcasts to really retain that audience and give them a lot of value over time. Yeah, because I do write a blog for each episode, so maybe that should also be a newsletter, 100%, or at least part of it, yeah. anyway. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Mm-hmm. I think Patreon is another one as well for podcasters that are, is good to use because you can offer exclusive content. It's another way of doing things as well. Yeah, these are things I've kind of thought about, started, didn't go well, left, come back to, so it's on my radar. But it's another thing to do, isn't it, amongst all the other things. It's quite hard if you're on your own, like I am, so... If I'm trying to do YouTube and a podcast, which is weekly and long format mostly, and travel and try and get content, it's, it's a lot. So I guess uh, I need to read your book about how to get the freelancing going and maybe even export some of the, the jobs or out, outsource it, right? So yeah, it's on my radar. Yeah, definitely. I'm going to go to travels for sure. And I've actually got two sets of questions for travels. One set is going to be just travel, personal travel. And one maybe based on the digital nomad mindset, because I'm quite intrigued by that. Um, so for traveling, what type of traveler are you? Are you a backpacker? Are you mid-range? Are you luxury? Can you rough it up? Are you looking for five-star hotels? Like, what's your style? Yeah, I think it's kind of in the in-between where I really like finding cute Airbnbs, but I also like the digital nomad co-living space. Mm-hmm. And so I've, I've kind of like experimented with some different co-living, like digital nomad hotels, like Outsite and Selena. Um, and I think that those are fun, but I do think that like the, my favorite places I've stayed have been Airbnbs because I think that I travel with my partner, Kyle. So it's nice for us to have like a kitchen and like, like workspaces and we both have like zoom calls. And so it's nice to have like a, a space of your own. And as an introvert, I like, I really appreciate having like kind of like an apartment away from home. And because I'm a full-time traveler, I don't have an apartment or anything back in the States. And so I, mm-hmm. I'm full-time traveling, so my rent is the Airbnb of the month or wherever we're staying. Yeah. And so I think that that's kind of the the better thing. I think the the challenging thing is always, like, how do you build community as a nomad? And so staying in, in these, like, kind of, like, digital nomad hotels or we travel occasionally with digital nomad groups is, is helpful. But I do always kind of feel the sense of, like, oh, I kind of want a little more personal space. And so having, like, a, a one- or two-bedroom apartment has kind of been the, the priority. And so traveling through, like, Airbnb, and we found some like really cute Airbnbs that are like very well priced, like all over the world. And I think that I think that kind of trying to understand like, what place, like where, what, what is like your expensive cities that you're going to be in a year, and mm-hmm. then what are the cheaper cities that you're going to be in a year, and kind of combine them so that you can kind of like have like really cool places, but not blow out your budget. Yeah, I'm trying to work that out for my trip in November, right? Because I'm going to Central America for a month, but I'm traveling solo this time. And accommodation is a big question for me because naturally I'm a I'm a bit of a backpacker and hostel guy, but the f- thought of doing a four bed dorm where it's like cubicles or even bunk beds, I'm just not sure I can do it because I'm also a bit introverted, but also have content to crack on with, right? So I need that that bit of space. But then you look at private rooms in, in, in hostels, they're not even that cheap anymore. So I think, ah, oh. then you start filtering away from that and going into hotels, which aren't that more expensive. So like El Salvador, for example, when I'm looking in San Salvador, not that much difference between a private hostel and just a, a budget, okay-ish looking hotel. And then you go to Airbnb. And it's like, oh, there's better value there. But part of me doesn't like Airbnb because of some stories I've heard and the way they treat locals. But I don't think it's the same for every country. So if I could find someone that's genuine, where it's like the old style Airbnb, where it's someone's house and you are literally living with the co- with the host, uh, that's fine. My only worry with Airbnb is meeting people. I don't know what your experience is of, I know you're traveling with your partner, but do you get to meet many travelers if you're booking like Airbnbs or anywhere that's like siloed, like a hotel room, how does that yeah. work out? And that's always a tricky thing, but we've joined a lot of digital nomad groups and that, that helps us where we're on their Slack. We're like, who's in town? And, and luckily we are, you know, we're always somehow overlapping with people and mm. we've made so many digital nomad friends over the past four years that were, we also kind of like slightly adjust our travels to be with other nomads. So we okay. were in Edinburgh for the Fringe Festival yeah. and a lot of our nomad friends were going to be there. So we did that in part to see them in part to be for the Fringe Festival. And so I think that it's like trying to kind of figure out like what are the spaces that I want to be in, trying to figure out what types of digital nomad groups you want to join. Mm. 
So I think that that helps a lot, but it is, it can be a little bit more isolating to stay in an Airbnb or a hotel, but it's just about really spending the time and the effort to build that community. I think the community question is always something that my partner and I go back to. We're like, are we, are we satisfied with our, the community we have around us? Mm-hmm. And it's not, we're not, we're not quite sure. Like sometimes like we're very satisfied. We're around people we really appreciate, but I think that it's always tricky. It's like the balance of that is the hardest thing because you're having these amazing experiences. You're meeting really cool people, but then they're gone after a few days if you're not traveling more like with them. And so I think that that's the thing is like the transient nature of this lifestyle is difficult on the community side. And so that's eventually when we do settle down, like the priority will be building a more permanent community. But I think that like some people have really aced it and really know how to build a community when they travel. But I think that I think that's the tricky thing, especially if you're traveling with a partner and then then it becomes a lot easier to stay in and like hang out with them. And so it, it's like, it removes a little bit of the incentive to meet new people as well. So it's like I think that balance is tricky, especially because I am such an introvert and it's like it, it's tough. So I think that that's the thing that I haven't fully figured out as the highest extent that I think that other people have cracked more. Than- yeah, I think you're absolutely right about that. And I think maybe... I do counteract with the Airbnb question of maybe doing, doing like a free walk and tour. So I booked two for San Salvador, uh, two in two days. They're going to do roughly the same thing, but you know what? I'm going to meet two locals and maybe three, four, five, ten other people in each of those groups, right? So I feel like, you know what? Let's, let's, let's do that. Let's maybe like see who I can meet. But one of those one of those free walk and tour guys has agreed to come on the podcast. So that's going to be quite interesting. He looks quite eccentric. Amazing. Yeah, he's a local. Nice. My sort of philosophy with podcasting whilst traveling is trying to get uh, local people if failing that maybe an expat who's lived there for a while right so that's the niche i, I try to get when i'm traveling but it's pretty cool because he's he's called dave and he looks quite a, an interesting character so, yeah but i the community thing is a problem in terms of when you travel even normal times if you're not looking to like be this or no but just travel two or three four months like southeast asia is a classic example you are going to bump into the same people but they are gone after two three days and you might see them again in two weeks if you're on the same route but like those amazing experiences do last only for two days and they were three days and that's it. They're gone. Like you still, you still get my Facebook or on Instagram, but the likelihood of being in touch with them again in the same sort of environment is quite rare. Yeah. And I think that that's a tricky thing that, that everyone's trying to solve in the digital nomad community. Like there's so many groups and apps and, mm. and environments. I think it's just tricky because it's like people don't invest in things that they don't see as long term. And I think that even though there's, a, I've met so many amazing people on my travels, like I've, I've really connected with a lot of people and, and, and stayed in touch with with a lot but I think that it's just the long-term like friendships that become deeper often have to be the ones where you just see them in person more than once every six months sure and so I think yeah. that is the thing that is like the only downside of the one of the few downsides of the digital nomad lifestyle if you're able to build a remote business and travel and not work too much and be able to stay in Airbnbs that you really like and then like like that those pieces can are all very flexible but i think the thing that i've seen i've heard from a lot of nomads is that they once they realize they can't fully get to that like level of community that they want they usually kind of decide to like get out of the cycle and then have a home base and that be where their their community is and i think right. that there's a lot of different types of nomading from like full-time nomading to just like you have a home base and then you do like workation or you know one or two to three months trip during the year and so i think that eventually i'll probably move to the model of like having a home base and traveling for a few months out of the year i think that's the model we're going to after our, our year trip eventually because you said that you are full-time traveling right in terms of you don't have a base and you're that's the same with us last year we quit everything here left and took everything with us so no base no anywhere so i'm like ah oh, that was great but the thinking that came to my mind is it wasn't actually really based on community is more based on just chilling out because if you do you manage to have a base and it's not too much an expense that could be like a small apartment somewhere where you want to be based at least you can go home and chill out for two months if you've just been traveling for too long or you just need a, a break to maybe do some creatively or you just want to chill out maybe you can catch up with old friends whatever it is but obviously we couldn't do that because we're still in the same trap of trying to get an airbnb or or somewhere at home even so i think we've we thought you know what a base is good for long-term travel i think because you can just quit after six months and go do you know what? i'm gonna chill out for a summer and then go back to it after that so that option would be pretty cool yeah definitely and so i think that that's the thing that everyone's trying to figure out for themselves mm. like what what does it make sense and so 
I think that there's sometimes it's also very freeing not to have a home base. So I remember yeah, when yeah. I gave up everything yeah. and sold my car in Los Angeles. I'm like, goodbye. Yeah. <laughs> it was great. Like, it's, it's so best freeing. in the world that like, morning when you like clean yeah. the thing up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think that there's something very, when you first become a minimalist, because I was a very much like a clutter fiend before, oh, okay. like yeah. being able to get rid of everything and like the, and I only travel out of a carry on suitcase. So that's, that's all of my clothes yeah. for all four Same. seasons. And I think yeah. that that's so freeing and mm. so cool to be able to just like, become a minimalist and realize you didn't need to spend all the money on all of that stuff and i think yeah. that that is like that lifestyle shift is huge and so when i eventually get a home base again i'll know how good it, it feels to be a minimalist and be able to like really kind of like keep my minimalist lifestyle with a base so that i can still travel but not get overwhelmed by having to maintain a bunch of stuff and like be worried about like a car or like things like that and so I think being a minimalist and, and really kind of reshaping your lifestyle like after travel, I think I think that that is like a good superpower to have. Yeah, it's pretty freeing. Um, but you're right, I've been kind of working that out for 12 years. So finally, took 12 years of doing that, you know, leaving job, quitting everything, selling everything. So I have that lifestyle, not working though. But that's a different conversation. But yeah, I think it's, it's a journey. I think people need to work out what they want. And I think it changes over time and with age and who you're with, who you're not with. But as well, I think that changes. Uh, you're thinking on it. Um, let's go back yeah, to the, actually the original. Oh, go, go, go on. Yeah, go on. but one one more thing. Like, I think that's a yeah. little the blessing. Exactly what you're describing. Like that ability to like wipe the slate clean and start yeah, over. Yeah. I know yeah. so many people who are stuck in their same lives and they're unhappy in their same lives and have just been stuck for like ten years. And I think that that is like the trap that a lot of people get stuck in. Is like, oh, I have mm. this house and or this apartment and this like car and a pet and like this is my life and I cannot leave it. And this is what I am like, like, even if I'm unhappy, then this is what I'm stuck with. Whereas like, it's so cool that like, I'm able to travel and just be like this place. I'm not going to move here after all. I'm going to keep yeah. on traveling or like, I think I'm going to be here. Just kidding. We're going to Portugal. And so <laughs> I think that that like ability to, to try to have a lot of messy action and try things out, I think is like the beauty of travel because you can try yeah. on identities and places and environments and friends. And then decide wait, yes to that, no to that, and then this is working, but this isn't. I think that that's the true gift of, of travel is also understanding yourself in a deeper level. Yeah, slow travel as well, right? Having the ability yeah. to make those decisions. Yeah, that's a dream, dream scenario. I think if you can get your your working, making money thing sorted, where it's online, and you then have the ability to choose where to go. I don't see a better lifestyle than that. And my rule, even though I'm a bit more um, settled for this year here, is can I just quit tomorrow and if you get that into that position where it's a yes i think that's a good place to be if you're no and it's based on a huge mortgage or uh, just expenses or debt or whatever it is that's a problem because you are trapped and if you're a big traveler but you're trapped that sounds like covid to me where you can go travel because of one thing or another that only this thing is money or or bills right so i think people need to be aware of that if they're looking to maybe escape they need to give themselves the ability to escape Otherwise, it's quite difficult. You're right. People spend 10 years thinking about it and it just that decade goes, right? Crazy. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Travel. So I've got here just a little bit daft if I go too deep, like three places that you travel to personally um, where you thought, do you know what? These places are amazing, probably my favorite places or you've even gone back to because you loved it the first time. Yeah. Uh, the first one immediately comes to mind, obviously, Peru. I think the, everyone should do the Inca Trail, Machu Picchu. Yes. I think it's a yeah. just a life-affirming experience. And also produce and the avocados in Peru is insane. <laughs> like, we took a cooking class where we ate, like, this exotic fruit that tasted like a vanilla custard. It was amazing. So the food in, in Cusco is so good. So definitely think that. And then secondly, Istanbul, Turkey. I went for the first time this year gorgeous gorgeous city just on this beautiful stretch of water and the food is amazing turkish breakfast i ate oh. turkish breakfast like so many times during my month there yeah just what is possible for breakfast just like the rest of europe can learn so much from istanbul i think that we need to like <laughs> we need to we need to like up our game like everybody needs to understand <laughs> what turkish breakfast brings to the table delicious and then i think third Buenos Aires, Argentina, such an underrated city, just so cool. Mm -hmm. A lot of good salsa dancing. The we went to a tango show that was amazing. But I think that there's just like such a beautiful architecture, and the the coffee shops are amazing. Even though I don't drink coffee anymore, like I love cafe culture. And mm -hmm. I think that like that city just has like kind of this European flair, but like filled with like this like Latin American charm. And it's just like a very very interesting, unique place. And I just had an amazing time, and everybody was so friendly there. 
Um, even though the mosquitoes were crazy, the food was amazing uh, and it made it worth it. And so I think Argentina as a whole should be on everybody's list. But oh, yeah. Buenos Aires was just amazing. Yeah, it's interesting you say Cusco and the first answer, because if I was to, I'm going to come to this for you in a minute, to think of two, like two or three areas in the world that I just want to try out as a digital nomad, because I've been there before as a traveler. Cusco is one of those. I love the city. And maybe because I just felt like a sense of achievement after doing Inca Trail and I was chilling out for a bit, just checking out the city, wandering around the cobble streets. I just loved it. Just loved the vibe. Maybe that's like a post hike achievement high, if you like. But I need to go back and see it in a normal time of not doing Inca Trail and just kind of confirm what I thought. But I love the city. Amazing. Yeah, cool. What about three places? that your favorite for digital nomading so i guess this might change a little bit because you've got to think of maybe lifestyle internet uh, even food comes into that as well and, and maybe cost as well so where, where are you thinking for that yeah i i don't have in greece was actually ah. amazing with food mm. fast internet like nice like some pretty affordable airbnbs in certain parts of the city like you have to be a little careful with what neighborhoods you pick but i think that yeah. like the food was just exceptional. I think a lot of tourists skip Athens or just use it as a, a jumping off point for the islands. But Mental. you're close to just some really beautiful places and the food was amazing. I mm-hmm. think Athens is like just a really great place. And the locals that we met were really friendly and cool. Um, and then I would still say Istanbul. I think that mm-hmm. I think it stayed in this really great neighborhood. It was like the Beglu neighborhood. And it was kind of like the neighborhood where all of like the models were shuttled to like go hang out in between photo shoots. But it was also just like a very hip, cool neighborhood with oh. so many just kind of like interesting, like little food spots and like little like there's a ton of barbers, and like hairstylists in that little neighborhood. It was just like this weird hipster kind of area that mm-hmm. was really, really cool. So I think the Beiglu neighborhood of, of Istanbul, it's like a little bit more pricey than other parts of mm-hmm. Turkey, but I think it's worth it for like how cool like walking distance you are to so many different things in that area. And then I think the third place would probably, this is kind of like, Oh, this is hard because there's so many really cool places. I feel like Lisbon is great. Like I think mm. Lisbon is a little bit oversaturated now. I haven't been in a few years, but when I went, I just loved how, how temperate it was, how being like right next to the ocean just like was really beautiful. And the architecture and the city is just so charming, so beautiful. I have a lot of friends who just ended up getting the digital nomad visa and staying there. They loved it right. so much. And so yeah. I think that, that Lisbon just has a charm, even though I know it's completely overrun with nomads in a way these days, but I think that it, it is for a reason and to be so close to the ocean and, and to be just like in such a beautiful city and the pasta donatas, the custard tarts oh, are just so, so good. I was sad. <laughs> it's amazing. They're three great cities. Yeah. Uh, in Istanbul, we have, uh, my partner has someone here who's from Turkey, from Istanbul, and she told us to go to an area called Moda. If you went to Moda, has a nice little uh, walk along the water, trendy, trendy cafes, one of the best breakfasts I've had on our traveling year last year just an unreal little area a bit weird in terms of weather it was a bit, a bit foggy that day but once it cleared up the view is is incredible over the water so that was the area that we went to called moda i think it's a pretty hip trendy area as well a bit like yours but what a place istanbul is that's a crazy place that's a that has everything if you want chill or crazy or both in the same day you can find it yeah it's cool okay have you ever experienced culture shock yeah, I think probably Tokyo and Kyoto. My first okay. time in Japan. I think when I, I just, I would travel with a group of nomads and like as part of our like first few days there, one of the, the nomads we were traveling with gave us like a rundown on like the culture and the etiquette and the rules and what you were allowed wow. to do and not yeah. allowed to do. And I just felt, I felt like, oh man, there's so many rules. You could bring socks <laughs> with you just in case they, they make you take off your shoes and at dinner, but that you don't want like bare feet on the things. And so yeah. you have to be mm-hmm. quiet on the buses, like no talking on public transportation. You're not allowed to drink coffee or tea and walk at the same time. You can't eat food and walk. And it was just so many rules. <laughs> and so I was just like completely like my first few days there, I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to like Japan. I don't know if this is a place for me. I like rules, but maybe not this much. And everyone's very quiet and very polite. Like, I don't know how to feel about this. But then I ended up joining a yoga studio for the month that I was there in Kyoto. And I just had a really great time. I got to know one of my instructors who was really amazing. And like, she kind of told me about like her upbringing there and like about like what she like, like her journey as like a yoga instructor. And like, I just really bonded with her and some other locals and people that were very friendly. And so I think that like, even though the rules based coach culture was very Mm -hmm. upsetting at first, I understand why and like the reverence that they have for keeping their city clean and quiet and nice. And it's just such a peaceful city. And I would just like go to my yoga class and then work at Blue Bottle for the day and then walk back through the Imperial Gardens and 
it was just this like beautiful peaceful routine in in the city and so even though i was culture staff was a little high i got over it and like followed all the rules and and it felt like the city was very very peaceful and nice because of it even though i wouldn't spend too much time there i think that i really enjoyed it for for what it was okay yeah japan amazing country but i think you know weirdly we had i thought i had culture shock at the end of my trip in japan after a Mm. month we finished in osaka and i was like what is this place there is transport (laughs) on the same level above me and beneath me it's all intertwining i'm like i just had japan for for a month i think i thought i was used to but osaka for me was a different level just couldn't get my head around it yeah really weird you you think it'd be at the start of a trip wouldn't you but i found tokyo like a bit okay for that i thought oh do you know what It's, it's okay start it's not too bad but osaka at the end I need to go back actually Osaka. and just yeah, kind of yeah. See what Osaka I think is now. like also kind of like feels like the Venice Beach of Japan. Like it's very weird, like very like 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 I, I'm not sure if you spent any time in Venice Beach in Los Angeles. But oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Trendy. It's just like we. I remember walking down a street in in Osaka and seeing a man in a Spider Man costume dancing to a violinist who was playing on the street. <laughs> I was like, "Where are we? We left Japan. I don't know what's going on here." So it was a very strange vibe in like the heart of Osaka, but very. But yeah, the transportation is insane, and sometimes I'm amazed to, to navigate. Even yes. in Tokyo, I, I like mm. I got to a point where I was like in this train station, but I couldn't tap out because. I had gone the wrong way and like so I was like trapped inside and I had to get someone to help me and I was just like I can't leave it won't let me like to like <laughs> like pay to leave this train yeah. station it's just very it's a little overwhelming yeah absolutely yeah I hear you yeah Venice Beach lovely by the way yeah very trendy has there been a place either traveling or as digital nomad where you didn't like and actually left earlier or couldn't wait to get out of Yes, the Amalfi Coast. It's cursed. Nobody should go to the Amalfi Coast. Oh wow! We we arrived. This is also right like in 2021. So COVID wasn't fully over, it, and the Amalfi Coast had gotten really hit by it. And so mm-hmm. we were immediately like price get price gouged by the taxi driver who like mm-hmm. doubled how much we were being charged. Like restaurants were way like clearly had like doubled their prices. It was just like, and it's also like we were staying like like on hills so to get to the beach we had to go down like 400 flights of stairs yeah <laughs> and so wow. to go back up it was awful and so it's like we didn't like the food it was like everybody there was like it was very touristy like it was not like i, I think if you're gonna do the amalfi coast like do two or three days in like the major resort mm-hmm. and then get out like but i i thought that it was out of all the beach towns that i stayed in that was one of my least favorites that one in santa Teresa, costa rica which is awful i think another like completely turned into like a like a uh, very touristy place where the locals have been exploited and they take that out on yeah. the tourists and like it's just not it's just not a good vibe and way too expensive to be like drinking an eighteen dollar smoothie on a dirt road like that's that's not that's not what we're here for <laughs> no definitely not here for that yeah and so it's like if you're gonna pay california prices you should be in california yeah and so i think that i think that those two places i feel like beaches are really hard to find good cities on mm. and that's why madeira has been so amazing because it doesn't feel like tourists have descended on this place even though it is pretty touristy like like it's very peaceful and it feels like a lot of locals are still here and it feels like more relaxing and, and peaceful and i don't feel like that you know, it's turned into like a Disneyland, like some of the other other. Yeah, I think from from Madeira, I think if you're willing to drive, there's loads of little pockets away from Fun Chao. Well, I just don't think you'll see many tourists. I can't really remember in our little area. I know we walked down; it wasn't really a beach, but it was like a. So Madeira's got loads of roundabouts, and then like as you know, loads of tunnels and roundabouts. Like just the one village over where the shop was and a little gathering area of a beach wasn't that busy. That's fine. All locals, pretty much. A few tourists. So I think if you're willing to drive in Madeira. You can definitely find your little pocket of, uh, I guess, traditional Madeiran life. Um, but yeah, you're right. Trying to find beach towns in Europe, yeah, it's tough. Uh, I think they're kind of all been talked about, uh, holidayed, written about. Yeah, I think it's hard to find those little gems, I suppose, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I think that, like, as nomads, like, especially if you're not traveling for vacation or if you're just traveling for longer periods of time, the the places that people go on holiday kind of like have a little bit less of an appeal. Because yeah. I feel like I'm always trying to find a place that I can be based in for a month and spend a good amount of time in. And so the problem with beach towns is like people are just going for vacation. So there isn't really like a, a way to like live there for any longer than a few days and feel like it's a it's a good time. Mm. Um, and so I think that's also the difference of the type of traveler you are. It's like if you're just going for vacation, then you might really love the Amalfi Coast because you're in and out for a few days and you don't care how much money you're spending on like 
overpriced food because you've got the beach and the ocean and things yeah, like yeah. that. But I think that if you're a nomad, it's like you're going for like cultural experiences and to be immersed in a place and to understand like the history of it and like and, and you want something more than just like margaritas on a beach. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, that's why I chose Carpathos Island in Greece as my as my island of, to go to. I think that's a bit of a gem in between Rhodes and Crete who get the most tourists, I guess. Um, but in between is an island that no one really goes to. And uh, yeah, I met a couple of like digital nomads on there, which I think they're one of the only very few who live there full time. I think there's like a couple. And uh, yeah, they bought a house really cheap and it's right by the airport and by the beach. I'm like, oh. Oh, wow. Yeah, nice. so couple of those islands if you're looking for a non-busy Greek island. Um, okay, what have I got here? Uh, yeah, we've done those 10 places. Yeah, it's kind of like digital nomad questions, really. Like key piece of information or key tips, maybe for someone who look, who's looked to transition into being digital nomad from like traditional life. Yeah, I think the number one thing that everybody should do is become a minimalist. Okay, yeah, and I agreed. Think that I and I because I started the digital nomad life with a check bag, and that was the biggest mistake ever. Okay, and I think that I think that anybody who thinks that they need a check check bag, even if you're going to be in a place for a month, you are going to like regret thing to lug that check bag through the airport and if your flight gets delayed like mm -hmm. it's, it's not worth it and you start to dread travel days and so very early on in my digital nomad journey i'm like okay this is it i'm downsizing there are too many scares in the world to have a check bag getting to a roller bag and a backpack i think is kind of the clutch thing to do especially if your backpack fits on to your little carry-on roller bag and so you can just wheel them around the airport and not worry about putting your backpack on like the gross airport floor I think that that's like the perfect combo. I know that some people do backpacks, but I, I think yeah. that the, the roller bag is kind of nicer, a little bit more hygienic and easier to kind of like lug around. It's a little more annoying on cobblestones, but I think, you know, you're, it's, <laughs> it's fine. I think the trade-offs are worth it because you I spend could. more time like in the airport. And so I think that what getting down to that and then still reserving space in your bag because you still realize like, oh, I actually need an extra pair of pants or I need sure. this. And so you end up mm. having to buy things anyway. So it's like you almost have to be more of a minimalist. So not only just fitting into a carry-on suitcase, but fitting onto a carry-on suitcase with like a third space for your trip so that you can have some time to like buy some small things or buy a, like a wardrobe item and i think that being a minimalist is like then suddenly frees up so much more space creatively work-wise productivity-wise it just makes you feel better and i have been a maximalist for all of my life and i feel like the t moment i became a minimalist i saved so much money my life changed like and then being able to like travel lighter just is like a psychologically different feeling and it also makes the ability to just go and, and jump on a plane feel a lot easier yeah, agreed. Minimalist is key. I, I don't think I could ever be not that anymore. I think once you transition to that, it's hard to see the need to clog up a load of stuff. Uh, the, the only stuff you could really clog up in my mind is books. I don't know what you feel about that. I mean, you can't be a good book, can you, physically, when you buy the book? So that's the only thing I can think of where I would clog up on on stuff, I think, and, and maybe like tech for creating podcasts or, or, or YouTube stuff. Do you have a Kindle? Do you have like a I e do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I bought one. A month ago. Yeah. yeah. I think that that's clutch. I, I actually really love the e-reader because it allows you to read in the dark with the yes. best light and you can yeah, highlight yeah. things. And I just got like the Kindle Unlimited subscription so you can read like Same. unlimited books. And yeah. like, I think that that's kind of like the clutch thing. And I, I think that a lot of people, like I, I love reading physical books, but I, I think I've finally gotten to the point where I'm like, okay, the Kindle is just, it's good enough. It's perfect. It's like all I need. I can like buy books later and yeah. I can get it's also more cost effective with like the Kindle Unlimited and like the cheaper ebooks. And so it's like, it is better overall. And it's like, it, it's more of a minimalist move that I think is, I think it's just better. Okay. I'm glad to hear that. Cause I, I was a bit cringe about it. Like, oh, I'm not buying books anymore. But for traveling, it's light, easy to pack, and it lasts ages if you're going to charge it up. So I think it's a perfect companion for traveling if you're looking to read. So yeah, I'm really excited about it. Okay. And I've got here. About the services that you offer and i want to hear about maybe like where people can find you like websites social medias but also what services you can offer in terms of like yeah. freelancing or releasing books and stuff like that definitely so everyone can find me at my website amysuto.com and on my social media at pseudoscience so my last name at uto science that basically the services that i offer is memoir ghostwriting as well as help with certain people's projects for book editing and book publishing 
I'm a little pickier on which products I take on for book publishing and book editing and book marketing because I work with a, a book, I collaborate with a book marketing team that helps, but I only want to work with certain types of projects. But I'm mm -hmm. all, always happy to hear what people are working on to see if it's something that falls under my wheelhouse that I can help them with. Um, and then for book ghostwriting, I usually help entrepreneurs. I do mostly nonfiction, but I've occasionally started to take on some fiction projects and that's, that's been really fun so far too. And then on the coaching side, I also offer coaching packages for people who want to get into freelancing or people who want to grow their sub stack. And yeah, so those are the kind of the, the things that I do and help people with. And then I have a ton of free resources on my website, amysudo.com, and then my sub stack from the desk of amysudo.substack.com. Awesome. Okay. I'll put links all in the show notes there. Your last name Suto. Where's that from? Who knows? I, I'm okay. heard Polish. Like we, we have, we, my heritage is a mystery. One of many things I'm trying to okay. guess though, so, but we're not really sure what happened on Ellis Island to get our last name shortened to, <laughs> it's probably like pseudo Winsky or something. And we're like, nope, can't spell that. And so can't Fair. pseudo, but no, I'm, I don't have an exotic background. I'm just a <laughs> Polish immigrant. Okay. <laughs> and I've got to finish the episode before we go to the quick fire travel questions. Uh, where have you been featured? Because I know on your website, if people go on there, you're going to see where you've been featured that's quite impressive can you tell the listeners and the viewers where you've been featured before yeah i've gotten bylines and publications like the la times my work has been featured in bbc worldwide business report i was interviewed and then parade magazine and forbes and a whole bunch of other places okay so yeah quite quite a few and i have a few more bylines coming out this year with some other pieces i've been commissioned to write in for different publications awesome and I've got Substack on here. Obviously, people should sign up to your newsletter, right? If they, yeah, you're everyone is welcome to. <laughs> and I, I share a lot of travel tips on there. I have free travel guides on my website, amysudo.com. And so if you want to stay in the loop of travel destinations and tips on how to make writing your job and things like that, my, my Substack and website have all, all, the, all the links. Okay. And what are you reading at the minute? One fiction and one nonfiction recommendation or just what you're reading? Yeah, I have sworn off nonfiction after reading not exclusively nonfiction for like six years straight. So I'm not reading any nonfiction. Wow. But I picked up this book called The Witch Collector, which is a really fun, like romanticy book following a like a society where a, a witch is collected from a village every year to help fight in this war. Uh, and it, it's very fun so far. So that's the current one that I'm reading. What's the reason for nonfiction? I overdosed on reading okay. way too much nonfiction. So I, I, I put myself through this like, like, self-development self bender yeah, yeah. COVID. <laughs> yeah yeah like That's i think all of us minute, did yeah. yeah yeah and i think that everyone has to go through that so i read like rich dad poor dad i oh, read gosh. like the mountain is you yeah uh, your body keeps the score like I, I i i like stacked up like 30 like self-help development finance books and when i got to the end of it and they started to like i started to read nonfiction books and they started to reference other books that i'd read, read. i'm like yeah mm, we're all starting like the echo chamber i'm in the echo chamber and so when I, the thing that kind of broke my reading slump in fiction was um, I finally realized that I was being a baby and I, I was making fun of all of these best-selling books in the fiction realm. Of, like I was like sneering at them and looking down at them, but then I picked up Akotar and then I couldn't sleep for a week and I just like stayed up till like 3 a.m. reading these books. I'm like, all right, I'm back to fiction. I just needed to read what was <laughs> popular and everybody loved because those books are popular and everyone loves them for a reason. And yeah. so that's kind of what brought me back into fiction is not being a snob and reading books that are popular. Fair. Okay. And the last couple of questions for the quick fire travel questions. Where, where have you been this year um, based in around the world? Yeah. Uh, Japan, Turkey, South Korea, um, uh london and, and like the uk and edinburgh um and poland and argentina and in the states for a little bit and a few other places i'm probably forgetting okay and madeira of course where you are now and madeira okay. yeah what's coming up for next year do you have any plans already in place or is that too soon a little too soon i'm currently trying to plan a tip for trip to paris in a few weeks and then potentially a trip to go see one of my my ghostwriting clients and so trying to lock that into place first because i'm going to try to catch uh, glass animals in concert in paris and oh, also right. okay. overlap some work trip stuff so yeah but I, i've been obsessed with glass, glass animals as a band right. and so i'm trying to see them in person my schedule's always like been the wrong place wrong time okay and we're gonna finish with some quick fire travel questions these are some of the uh, favorite things forever from travel wise so i might throw in a few digital nomad ones i'll kind of make them up on the spot um so let's kick off with you've given us three favorite places but if tomorrow there are no rules and you can go anywhere in the world three places what are your top three 
places that I've been before or new places? Uh, I tend to go new places for this question, yeah. Yeah, uh, I always want to go to Amsterdam and Switzerland and Sweden. I haven't gone because Northern Europe is very expensive and very cold at the times that I'm wanting to go. Sure. But I feel like Northern Europe is like the untouched place that I haven't ever gone yet. And uh, I haven't used up all my like my travel days and visa days like every year. So it's always like tricky and then it gets too cold. Okay. And as you mentioned it, what about three places that are not necessarily new? Not necessarily new. I would always go back to Lisbon. I think it's okay. great. I would I would go back to Porto, which is also a great city. Oh, I love yeah. Portugal. Yeah. And then I am excited to go back to Paris. And so that's the, the third place. Like I had a really good time the first time that I was there. Okay. Are you a sunrise or a sunset person? Sunset. I like sleeping in. Everyone says that. I've not really met anyone who said sunrise yet. Unreal. Okay. And you mentioned one tip before about being a minimalist, but Maybe three other key tips for being a digital nomad. Yeah, I think my favorite travel gadget has been packing a heated jacket so that you can reduce your jacket like and be able to like be able to like have like different seasons with like, like just one jacket. And wow. so having a heated jacket has yeah. been like my greatest travel hack. I've had one for the last two years that I love. So I think and it also has a phone charger in the battery pack. You can charge your phone while you're getting warm. So I think that that's something that everyone always asks me about when I'm wearing them. Like, yes, this is it. Um, and then the second thing would be to um, really travel hack with credit card points if you if you're mm-hmm. based in Canada or America um, because we, I've been able to get almost like like eighty to ninety percent of my flights for free this year and I think that that is like a, some big long haul ones too so I think that really kind of like maximizing travel hacking it's annoying to learn but it it really pays off in, in the mm-hmm. long run and then three I think everybody who is traveling should keep some sort of travel blog or travel diary or substack where they're sharing their travels with other people because it's not only a great way to meet people but it's also a great way to like have an income stream to monetize and then also just capture your travel so you can look back on them and and, and look back on them fondly and, and kind of explore the destinations through the way that you've captured it in a moment because if you don't capture it while you're there it'll just kind of start to fade from your memory yeah or well, you can podcast it like i did last year exactly. I've done, on average two a week yeah and Amazing. I haven't listened back actually. Be quite interesting, maybe in a in a few years. But that does document pretty much everything that we did. Yeah, so that's and that's another. If you don't want to write, just speak into a dictaphone or a microphone. That'd be a good way to do it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay. If you could sit somewhere for an afternoon and read a book and watch the world go by, where are you going to sit? Probably on the balcony that we have here in Madeira that overlooks the ocean. Like you can't like you can't get better than that. It's nice to be right here and to to just watch the sunset. And so I feel like that that's been the prime prime reading spot. Okay. What about top three favorite cuisines that you've experienced on your travels? Yeah, number one is definitely the Turkish breakfast. Mm-hmm. I will not stop talking about how great <laughs> that is. It's so so good. I'm a big breakfast person. Um and then I think Turkish, and then I guess I would say second, I would say Turkish food in general. There's some really cool kind of like the Turkish ravioli. It's just like everything I had in Turkey was amazing. And I would go back to just eat food in Turkey for like another month straight because it was so good. And then really did like, I think the ramen in, 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 in Japan was just next level. Like we'd be at like a train station in Tokyo and mm. then I would have ramen that just like blew my mind. And like, what is this? This is so good. And so I think that I love, I also love ramen. And I think that Japan just like really cornered the market on that. And then also Korean food outside of Korea, because when I was in Korea, there was no good vegetarian food. And oh, it's a nightmare. People, like, nightmare. It was a nightmare. Yeah, we struggled, nightmare. Yeah. But, then, but then when I left Korea and I had vegetarian Korean dishes in Singapore and on these other places, I was like, this is amazing. This is so <laughs> good. And so bibimbap made by people outside of Korea is fantastic. In Korea, they will like put a beef, like a steak, like in there and be like, here yeah. you go. I'm like, I can't, no. And so, yeah, bad, bad place for vegetarians. We found one amazing place in Gangnam in uh, in Seoul. Oh, uh, it's in okay. the, I think it's the, it's the Expo X something, the uh, the big shopping center there. And I think the restaurant's called Planted Shoot. And they do. Hey, you went there. Yeah, went they there. had amazing yeah, yeah. vegan Korean food. Yeah. That was incredible. Bit pricey, mm-hmm. but. Mm-hmm. That, that's what makes Korea a bit of a nightmare for that because you can't find it on the street. But if you're looking to maybe find something, yeah, you went there. I found it pretty incredible, to be fair. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. The fine, there's some fine dining, like vegetarian options. But like, like even even I went to like a like a like a burrito shop and they would refuse to take the meat out of the burrito yeah. and just serve me <laughs> the rice and the beans. I'm like, it's right. You just like there's something against like vegetarians there where they just they don't they don't like you. I understand it. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. 
Okay, what about three places as digital nomad that you might have heard in your community or in your groups that people are saying you've got to le- at least try to be a digital nomad there? Not necessarily travel, but maybe be based somewhere. Is there three places that you've heard that are on your radar for the future? Uh, yeah, people have talked about Mexico City that I haven't I haven't been yet. I've, I've had some friends have some bad experiences in Mexico, like very bad, and so I... That I've kind of been a little bit like I haven't been back. I've been to Mexico a long time ago, and so but I've heard Mexico City the food is amazing. It's a big digital nomad hub, mm. and then Chiang Mai in oh, yeah. Thailand. Oh, I've wow, like yeah. I've heard amazing things about that. Amazing, yeah. And everybody just says it's fantastic. So that's been on my radar. And then Bali, of course, everyone talks about Bali, but I've heard that it's like overrated. But I, I feel like I should go, but I don't know. And so that's the one where I some some of my nomad friends are like, it's not overrated. You gotta go. And then other people are like, it's way overrated, don't go. Overrated. So I think, yeah, and so I think I run into, it's very difficult to understand whose opinion to trust with some of yeah. these places. And so I think Madeira was one that everyone said go to, and they were totally right. Yeah, that's, yeah, I've talked about Bali a lot on my podcast, and um, probably won't talk about it again, but <laughs> I haven't been for 10 years, so maybe it's outdated. But even back then, I was like, oh, wow, this is like, even back then, 10 years ago, 2013, 14. I thought it was a bit out of control, but I don't know what it's like now. But there you go. Definitely. Yeah, maybe you might like it. I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah. And let's go with a favorite walk, hike, or trek that you've done. Maybe not Inca Trail. You mentioned that a few times. I know. I just love it so much. Um, I think, well, we did a walk through the foggy forest here in Madeira that I thought was really unique. Uh, because yeah. it's just like you're, you're, like you, you go from like you drive up the mountain, it's sunny and beautiful, and all of a sudden you get to the, the, the peak of the mountain and it just fog descends and you just can't see more than like a few feet in front of you. And then you're walking through this foggy forest and all of a sudden these trees that are like, Pearl, like witch's hands are like reaching out at you and it's just like very cool and then there's like a owl walks past you and you're like what are you doing here and so it feels like you're in this weird dreamlike surreal cloud in this forest and like you you can easily get lost so it's like you kind of have to be careful to like stay on a trail because otherwise it'll just get swallowed up by the fog and so i think the foggy forest here in portugal i, I love like places where there's like the, the cloud forest on the Inca trail is also great but the foggy forest here in portugal is really cool have you done the is it Stairway to Heaven trail? Is that no, what it's called? I'm kind of, I'm kind of, is that, is, is that the one in the foggy, the, the foggy forest? That yeah, like it goes really right long? along the top, right? It goes to a point. Yeah. Like, it might be the wrong name for it. I've been, I've been traumatized by stairs since St. Control. I'm like, I'm not, uh, same, I'm, I'm, same. <laughs> if I see, if I so much look at another pair's like stairs on a hiking trail, I, it's been too much. It's too much. I think I'm, I think I'm a hiker, but I'm like, a, I'm, I think I'm exactly the same. I was doing research the other day on the one in Guatemala in Antigua, the volcano hike. And it's, it's coming up for me in November. And my biggest thing, apart from my hip, which is a bit dodgy. The second thing is, has it got stairs? And I don't think it does. Mm-hmm. I think it's just volcanic, it's just volcanic ash. So not like hard setting, which is a problem, but I've done Mount Fuji, which is the same thing. And it's fine. But like no stairs, I can't deal with rocks or steps. <laughs> and I had that problem last year in, in Nepal and Langtang where they're big rock steps, and I I just get done in. I can't do no, no more it's steps. It's not fun. It's not. It's not enjoyable. You like look at them. You just look at them and you just see the pain yeah. your body's about to go through, and you're yeah. like, no, I don't want this. Like let's let's skip to the good part. Yeah, I don't mind like an incline where it's just a normal yeah. ground. That's fine, but no steps, no steps. <laughs> okay, and the last question will be. For someone who's listening right now, they could be either scared to go traveling or just can't make that jump to go international traveling or even to another state, but also maybe alongside that in a career, maybe a bit unhappy or unsure how to change their life. Any couple of sentences of wisdom that you can pass on to maybe why someone should travel and maybe at least give it a go? Yeah, I think that you have to live life to write about life. And whether you're a writer or creator or just somebody, you know, moving through the world, like you want to, you want to live a life well lived. And I think that you have to put yourself out there and do things that seem a little scary or a little hard, because if you, the other side, everything that you want is on the other side of your fear, as everyone says. And I think that's so true. And and there's a lot of things that I was terrified to do. I was terrified of traveling. I was terrified of leaving my Los Angeles apartment in the middle of COVID while I had an autoimmune disease and was like on these crazy like medications that were hurting my immune system. And I was like, but I feel like if I do this anyway, something is going to change my life like Italian pizza. And I was right. And so it's like the thing that I was on the other thing of the thing you're fearing is really good sourdough pizza in Naples. And that's worth any plane flight. Wow. I never thought I'd hear 
how pizza could be such a game changer in quite a significant and serious yeah. life condition. Yeah, it's, 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 it's like sourdough has good like gut bacteria and it yeah. changes your like like I like I if I had you know I would have loved pizza just like emotionally without that, but it's actually good for your gut. <laughs> Well, wow, there you go. Science. Awesome. Amy, thanks for coming on the podcast. It's been a great chat. Learned a lot. Very inspirational with your travels and your digital nomad stuff and also working as a freelancer. Uh, I think the audience will get a lot out of this and I'm really excited to share it. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me, James. Thank you, Amy. Cheers.